This presentation was recorded at the 2015 Gold Coast ANZIC Safety and Quality Conference on Deteriorating Patients. Thanks, Deb. Um, I'm going to do this presentation today and this, this study came from um, a conversation that I had with a colleague in Canada who was telling me about her father's experience who was dying and he turned to the nurse looking after him and said, see, I told you I was sick and dying. <laughs> so um, when we put forward this, uh, this study, we uh, sent it to the Australian Research Council and it was lucky enough to be funded. Um, there was um, comments came back when we put it up to the Ethics Committee about the title being um, leading to patients. So we actually had to change the title on the ethics form. So Jessica Gwenane is um, not able to be here to present today um, because she's unwell. And so I've inherited her presentation. So please bear with me um, in, as I go through it. So, of course, the background to this study is that um, there's been a lot of uh, news stories and anecdotal evidence of patients being missed uh, in, in terms of the resuscitation um, and the deterioration. And so we were really interested to know what their stories were. And as you would possibly be aware, um, whilst we've moved ahead in terms of having it incorporated as part of the standard for accreditation, there is actually very little evidence about it in the literature, in the research literature. So the contribution of um, families and patients has really been um, quite low level and, um, and, and very much not um, analysed in, in a research um, approach. So the research aims for this study were really to investigate the, the roles and the influences of patients and relatives in triggering. We really wanted to know, um, I guess, whether they felt they didn't have a voice and, and a way of expressing um, their, their feelings and their concerns. Were there things, were there some commonalities across um, interviews with lots of different patients? Um, and we really wanted to know whether their concerns were treated as evidence or not. So um, an interesting challenge was really how to analyse those stories. So we hear a lot about patient stories, but they're not necessarily analysed in a scholarly way. This approach using narrative analysis is a way of um, unpacking the, the stories of patients. But what it does, unlike thematic analysis, which is another approach we could have used, what it does, it takes all the stories from the patients and then it forms a new story. So it constructs a new story. And I think that's a, um, an interesting approach. And I was um, a little bit anxious about this because I hadn't used this method before. Um, essentially, you still interview the patients and families, but you don't um, offer them. It's not a structured interview. It's off, you have a, an exploration of what happened to them. And in, when people tell stories, they tell them in a very messy way. Even when you hear presenters, they tell stories in messy ways. They jump between things and they have interruptions and then they go back and say, oh, I forgot to tell you this and so forth. So you have to really, when you put that construction through, t through together, it, it looks... It starts off looking quite messy. So we also look at the medical records to see if we can get some sort of timeline associated with their deterioration over what, what actually happened to them. So we actually interviewed patients and families from both private and public hospitals, one of each. And so we were wondering if there was going to be a difference in the way families and patients approached things. Um, there was a number of inclusion and exclusion criteria. Clearly, someone had to be able to articulate a story. Um, we didn't have the funding for non-English speaking backgrounds, but if a family member could uh, do the translation and, and speak with us, then we could actually um, incorporate their stories. And obviously cognitive impairment was a one we had to exclude them on. So we actually interviewed um, 47 different participants. We had 33 members of um, patient family, sorry, we had 33 patients and 14 family members. Uh, there were six different constructions that came out of, this, of the study. The first one was about voicing concern. And so rather than people talking about physical signs and symptoms, they often just to talked about um, you know, that they felt, they felt unwell, they felt they did have pain, but they really just, they didn't recognise it as clinical deterioration. It was a, 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 just a general feeling. Um, the relatives typically recognised the difference that they looked unwell. 
and it wasn't, they couldn't also articulate what the level of physiological deterioration was, but they just weren't themselves, was it quite a common way of um, talking about it. So in each box, I've got tried to capture a couple of examples of some of the quotes that were taken from the patients. So, um, and the families, so, you know, shocking, shocking, I was feeling, I was freezing cold. I kept telling them I was freezing cold and really shivering like, I felt like I was in the Antarctic. So you can see it wasn't really anything, you know, we would translate it, that into something physiological, but patients didn't see that. They just knew they didn't feel right. Another one was about identifying the deterioration. So both patient groups acknowledged that it was the nurses who detected the changes. Um, the relatives sometimes um, identified and articulated that something wasn't right. And if relatives triggered the escalation, they were asked to leave the room, which I found really interesting. So, um, and I think it would be different if we'd actually looked at a paediatric area where you'd probably incorporate the, the family and the mother and parents and so forth in, in it. So I think this is very much um, looking at the adult story. Um, again, I was just feeling lightheaded. The nurse came in and said something to me. I didn't sort of catch it. And she said, I better take your blood pressure. She took my blood pressure and then the people from over there, uh, from over the way here came in, met. So you can see, um, you know, it sort of just goes out of their control. They actually are sometimes are just unaware of what's going on. In terms of communication, uh, the families were often um, quite satisfied with the communication, which is really good to know. Um, they were satisfied, um, but during the period of deterioration, the private patients it really felt that they weren't well enough to express the deterioration, so they didn't feel that uh, the patient and family activation, the escalation system was going to be of use to them because they didn't know when they were that sick. And they felt that it was really the clinical um, staff's responsibility to do the activation and that they would know when to do the activation. Um, public patients had much more of a dialogue with the clinical staff. They tended to um, express um, some, some of their, um, you know, their, what they were feeling. They would then go into, you know, sometimes they would know that, to say, that they, they, the nurse would acknowledge that their blood pressure had dropped or something. And the, 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 the public patients actually knew what the trigger points were, which was really interesting. Um, but they often felt dissatisfied that they were then waiting for the results. And they actually felt that the, the MET came and they just got onto things straight away. So they didn't have to wait with the MET. Whereas the home unit, they felt like there was a lot of delay. So that's interesting to use it as a get something happening. <coughs> So the clinical response um, by, in terms of the nurses, uh, they were very much in the public hospital system, the patients felt that they really followed a very strict protocol, the nurses. They attended to, they took their observations and they would say to the patients what was going on and then they would just escalate on the, on the pa basis of that protocol. Um, they really, um, they felt that there was um, more communication with the patient and family in the, in the public about the MET call. There was examples in the private system that the patients had no idea that METs had even been called and, until uh, Jessica went to interview them and, and you know, said, the reason I'm here is because you've had a MET call. And they were completely unaware that they'd had MET calls. So I think that's a, an interesting kind of space to follow up a bit more. Clinical trust is an interesting thing. The private patients very much felt that they, um, they selected their clinician, came into hospital, and that that clinician would know best, so that there was de definitely that um, handover of responsibility. They also felt that if they told someone what the, how they felt, that that was the end. They didn't have to take any further um, um, engagement in what was going on, that it would be handed over and someone else would deal with the issue. However, the, the public patients, they mostly trusted the clinicians' assessments and responses, but they felt very reassured when the, the MET arrived. And again, I think it sort of goes back to some of that communication. Um, if they'd been waiting for results, they knew that the, 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 the MET was seen as actually a patient, um, a safety net. So, um, for example, uh, the public patient, normally if you get into trouble, you'd ring the nurse. The nurse comes, and if they can't fix you up straight away, they ring someone else and someone else come, someone comes. If they can't fix that, then someone else comes. You normally get a result. 
So it's a, a, a sort of these constant lots of safety nets, which I think, um, you know, we've seen, we see the differences in hierarchies in terms of the public and private systems, because in the private system, you nurses ring the medical consultant straight away, but in the public system, you go through the hierarchy of resident, registrar, um, and finally the consultant if something can't be um, worked out before then. Um, in the met awareness, the private patients were not aware of the met um, and the reasons um, for the review. They, they um, had just no idea when uh, Jessica would go in to the, that they'd had, had METs, which um, I think is really interesting. The, private pa the public patients knew about the METs. They also knew the reason for it. They were familiar with the escalation language. And so if they'd um, had, for example, um, a low systolic blood pressure, they would, they would know they had a low BP and what the triggers were for it because they'd be watching it um, being taken and they'd ask what, the, what the, res um, the results were and so forth. So they seemed to be uh, more engaged, whereas the, the private patients seemed to hand over that responsibility. Um, an example is it wasn't until a few days later in this room I heard that Met call and I thought, what's that? And I looked it up on the internet and thought, oh, that happened to me. I think that's a good quote. Um, and you can see on this one, this quote too, it talks about hitting the trigger. I think it was about 120, but don't quote me. You know, so they've got a real sense of what are the things that would actually make a, uh, a difference in terms of... Um, their physiological status and when they needed help. So in conclusion, the question we started with, are patients and family perspectives treated as evidence of a deteriorating patient, a health status whilst in hospital? And it's a bit of a fence sitting thing, but I think when you've got two different um, paradigms, private and public, you're going to have a few different things because we've also got the different demographics of patients, both um, in terms of um, the cognitive impairment, which even though we didn't inter interview patients with that, families voiced that, that if, you know, if someone couldn't speak, I would have spoken up. So, so you can see yes, sometimes mostly the nurse is the one who detects and ex escalates the care. The patient is usually unable to communicate due to the deterioration. And yes, when the patient's cognitively impaired and when patients and family members are willing to communicate concerns, because of course, whenever you've had your own personal experience and you're you know, an articulate health professional, you know sometimes that you can be disempowered too. So there is always that, that time that you'll have um, some, some families that won't be able to um, communicate the concerns. But in essence, across all areas, the, the clinicians really were respected and trusted mostly, and that there was family concerns about trying to override them. So when you've got what is perceived as a system of override, then you are going to have less likely to have calls. And I think we need to think about that when we're talking about how to why, why the systems are in place about the patient and family activation, because I think it's some of setting the expectations of why, uh, why we do need these systems. So uh, if anyone would like to follow up and connect with Jessica, her email address is up there. Thank you.